In this video we are covering electric potential energy. But first let's take a quick look at what potential energy was. You might not remember this from covering it in your physics 1. Now potential energy is a shortcut you can use for solving problems without using Newton's laws. Using Newton's laws gets very insane. You end up using many pages of paper for a single calculation. No one wants to do that. Use potential energy. Secondly, a change in potential energy is not related to the path that a particle takes. It is completely dependent on a single position. So if you have this rabbit here and you want to toss that rabbit, the path that this rabbit takes, whether it's squiggly or whether it's a straight line, doesn't matter. The position along this axis is what matters. The potential energy anywhere on this axis is going to be the exact same. So if the rabbit's here and it's going to end up here, it doesn't matter how it gets there, it's still going to have the same potential energy either way. It sounds sort of esoteric, but that's just the way it works. So let's take a look at the actual equations here. You'll notice that electric potential energy is really similar to the potential energy and force energy from gravity. So over here you have the gravity times mass 1 mass 2 over the distance between them. And when you're dealing with the electric calculations you have the exact same equation. Only where in gravity you're using the mass. In electric you're using the charge on a particle. So G would be the gravity constant and K is just an electric constant. For force, you're going to square the distance between them, and for potential, you just use the regular distance between them. You'll probably get problems for both of these. Uh, just remember that force distance squared. Potential is just the distance. The zeros of the potential energy are when r approach infinity, and that's just sort of intuitive. When the distance between them becomes an infinitely large number, you end up with zero. Also, the potential energy for two like charges is also always, always, always going to be positive. When you put two like charges together, you have to do work to put them together because they're repulsed by their own charges. When you have two unlike charges, your potential energy is always going to be negative. So when you put two unlike charges together, they attract each other. This attraction does the work for you. This is really similar to your gravity problems, which sort of pulls on your mass. So if you did really well in your physics one class and all your Newton's law stuff, this electric stuff will be pretty easy. If you're taking your physics out of sequence, when you take your physics one, you'll have a big head start. So sort of animating that, here you have two similar charges. You have your charge one and your charge two. When you put them together on this number line, you would look at the total energy of the system, which is K plus U. K is your kinetic energy. This is not your constant. This is sort of unrelated. It's just sort of animating the previous point. K is a kinetic energy, and U is your potential energy. So if you take Consider this sort of like a number line or an x-axis. If you have a positive q1 charge here and a positive charge, which is q2 here, if you were to hold q2 steady and then let it go, q1 and q2's forces are going to repel each other. So the force acting on q2 by q1 is going to shoot it to the right over here in this direction. So your kinetic energy is going to go up as the particle accelerates and your potential energy is going to go down because it has a larger potential energy closer to Q1 than it does further away. Right? Common sense. So your total energy is going to be positive. So when you go back and you look at how you get your total energy, it's your K constant, your Q1 times Q2. So you have your K constant times two positive charges, and that gives you a positive number. If you have two unlike charges, your total energy is going to be negative, your kinetic energy is still going to go up, and your potential energy is still going to go down. So if you have two unlike charges, here you have Q1 with a positive charge, here you have Q2 with a negative charge. So if you were to hold Q2 
still and then release it at this position, the force acting on it by Q1 is going to pull it towards the origin, towards here at zero at Q1. So your potential energy is still going to go down because it has the most potential energy here. Your total energy is always going to be negative because again, coming back to your k, q1, q2, you're going to have a negative number up here when you multiply this out. So now that you know the basics and you've seen it animated, let's look at an example problem. And, and here you'll notice in the final values that your potentials for electrics are going to be much bigger than your potentials for gravity. Because forces for electric are general than forces for gravity, and you'll learn that as you get into forces inside the atoms and nuclear forces, but that's another video. So here we have a problem asking you what the potential energy of the system is. You have three charges, we'll call this Q1, we'll call this Q2, and we'll call this one Q3. So if you have multiple charges, it's not just the K, Q1, Q2. Well, it is, but you just add them all together. So you would essentially do the force of Q2 acting on Q1. And I sort of use this notation. You'll see it different in the different textbooks. Some will just look like that, Q1, 2, with the subheading on there. That just means the force of 2 affecting 1. So what you'll do is you'll get the force of 1 on 2, 3 on 2, the force of 1 on 3, 2 on 3, all the possible combinations, and you just add them together. So here are the combinations. So the force of 2 on 1, the force of 3 on 1, and the force of 3 on 2. All your combinations, because the force of 1 on 2 and the force of 2 on 1 are going to be equal, so you only really need to calculate that once. And the same with the 3 on 1, you only need to calculate that once. And the same with 3 on 2 and 2 on 3, it'll all be the same. So you just use your equation of the k times q1 times q2 over the distance between them. But here you have a charge of 1 micro column on all 3, and you have a distance of 0.1 meters in between all three. As you know, a microcoulomb is 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. It's just something you should commit to memory. It'll save you a lot of time. And here, your constant k is really easy to remember. 9 times 10 to the 9th. Your units are newton meter squared over coulomb squared. That's not as important. Just definitely commit all of this to memory. If you memorize anything, that will save you the most time. So then you just do your math. Here's your equation. Your u is k q1 q2 over r. Now since all three have the exact same charges, you only really need to do the calculation once. Because the math would be the same, whether it's q1 on q2 or q2 on q3. The distance between them are the same, and all their charges are the same, so you can just add them together. They're all positive charges, so you know that you're going to get a positive potential energy. So scrolling down, just substitute those numbers in. U is K times Q1 times Q2 over R. Here's your K constant, 9 times 10 to the 9th. And your Q1 and Q2, since they have the same charge, is just which is 1 microcoulomb, it's just 1 times 10 to the negative 6, and then you can just square that. They're both the same, just multiply them together, and that's pretty much a square. Stick that into your calculator, and you'll get 0.9 joules. Now, point 0.9 joules is just the charge of 1, and now remember, to get the total of the system, you have to add 1 of 2, 1 of 3, and 3 on 2 all together. So you can just take that and multiply it by 3. You don't have to do the same calculation three times, and you'll end up with a final answer of 0.27 joules. Now, why is this joules, if you started out with coulombs and newton meters squared and coulombs squared, so if you take a look at that, that's also it's related to the definition. Your units on your K are Newton times meter squared over Coulomb squared. And then your Q1 and Q2 are both in Coulombs, and that's over meters. 
So generally when I do the math, I'll do the math first and then do the a unit map afterwards. For me it's just easier. If it's easier for you to do it all together in, in one step, then have fun. It's really just a personal preference. For me it's easier to do two different maps and it's just advice. So when you have this, you'll have your meters will cancel out. Just Well this one will cancel out and you'll be left with one meter here. Your coulombs times coulombs is just another coulomb squared. So all of this cancels out. So now you're left with a newton and a meter from there. And a newton meter is a joule. You know that from physics one or maybe from your chemistry. So now this will link into electric potential and batteries. Those videos are coming soon. I hope this was helpful.